So the next thing I thought I'd cover is what are the different types of galaxies? And if we're going to talk about galaxies, we should probably talk just in general terms to begin with. So what is a galaxy? So galaxies are these enormous gravitationally bound collections of stars, gas, dust, planets, and they all swirl around a central supermassive black hole. And depends on the type of galaxy, sometimes that swirling is nice and ordered, and other times it's quite chaotic. And then all of these stars, this gas and this dust itself, is sat in an enormous well of dark matter. But I am not going to talk about dark matter, because this is Astronomy 101, and I feel like dark matter is Astronomy 105 or something like that. So we're just going to focus on the features which we, we can largely see with our eyes. And in terms of ratios, it varies galaxy to galaxy, uh, but by and large for the beautiful spiral galaxies, they're mostly mass um, is by stars, and then it's about 10% gas, and then 1% uh, of the gas is in the form of cosmic dust. It's my favourite. It has to go in there. It, it has, it has to, go to go in there. Because everyone, all the other astronomers, they're like, oh, cosmic dust is so annoying, gets in the way. And actually, it's, it's so, so important. It is. Bring me your dust. It is. It's so important. What did you do your PhD on? Do you know? <laughs> do you know? Drop the dust. Not some of them. I only have some of the dust fetish. Yeah. I was really amazed that no one like, bought me a Hoover when I passed my Viva. Like, I really was. I was half expecting it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, do you know, so my, my friend Chris, very dear friend, and um, he thought he was being really helpful once. He sort of phoned me up, he's like, oh, Jen, I bought you a telescope duster. Oh, it's amazing. I was like, did you find a telescope duster? I didn't know that they made, like, telescope dusters, like, you know, specially made. He's like, yeah, yeah, it's great, it's great. Like, when I see that, I'll give it to you, right? What have you bought? A telescopic duster. <laughs> <laughs> So these are the sort of four main types of galaxies that we'll be talking about. In the top left corner, we've got ellipticals. And then the bottom left, we have spiral galaxies. So this is a beautiful face-on spiral. And then in the top right, we have unusual hybrid galaxies. They're called lenticulars. And they share features of spirals and ellipticals. And then in the bottom right corner, we have the kind of catch-all category, which are irregular galaxies. So we'll begin with ellipticals and elliptical galaxies, they are the most massive and they are also the smallest galaxies. They kind of span the whole mass range because you can get elliptical galaxies which are little more than just balls of stars. They're little more than globular clusters. And then we also have the most massive giant elliptical galaxies, which could quite happily swallow sort of 60, 80 Milky Ways and still have room left over. <sighs> And if we have a look at elliptical galaxies, we can see that they do look quite yellowy. And that is because they ha are mostly made of these ancient stars. So smaller, longer lived stars. And from the first talk, we now know that smaller stars are cooler. And so they appear more yellowy, more red. And they are sometimes referred to as red and dead. And this is the red is referring to the colour of their stars, so they're yellowish, they're reddish. And dead because elliptical galaxies, they typically lack any significant amount of star-forming gas and dust. And this is because elliptical galaxies, we believe they quite often form from the mergers of other galaxies. And these merger processes, while they're happening, they trigger beautiful bursts of star formation. And so while they're happening, they're lovely to look at. But these bursts of star formation can just basically eat through all of that star forming gas and dust that's in these galaxies, leaving nothing for future generations of stars. And so then once they've been through this beautiful burst, that's it. They're kind of just living out their lives with these ancient aging stars. And their shape comes from the chaotic orbits of their stars. And those chaotic orbits are often introduced by these merger processes. So stars in an elliptical galaxy, they are orbiting every which way. And that's what gives them their round sort of football or rugby ball shape. Because you've got stars going this way, also that way. They're going like this. They're not centres around the middle of the galaxy. And that's why they are these kind of chaotic balls. Yes. So it's not the actual... 
elliptical shape because it's inclined, or, well, halfway between edge on and face on. It's not because it's inclined relative to us. Actually, the orbits <coughs> are yes. the orbits of the stars are actually elliptical. Yes, it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So with spiral galaxies, it's it's the way that we're looking at them. But with ellipticals, they can be perfect balls or they can be these more sort of squashed shapes. And that is entirely dependent on their evolution. And it varies exactly from galaxy to galaxy. Is it, is, when the elliptical name, does it come from the elliptical orbit or does it come from that it's like inclined to our line of sight or can it be both? So... So, I, yeah, so the elliptical shape, it depends, because if you've got like a, a rugby ball shaped galaxy, say, if you look at that end on, then it'll look round. But then if you look at it from a different angle, it'll be sort of rugby ball shapes. But some of them are just sort of spherical. That's the shape that they are. So some of them are more round, but then some of them exist. That is inclined to us. So yeah. It would appear elliptical, wouldn't it? Yeah, and then we can figure out the, the true shape of the galaxies based on the orbits of the stars and, and stuff like that. Yeah, so we can kind of, not always, but sometimes we can then determine between what's causing the shapes, whether it's just a visual or whether they are actually ball-like or name, more elongated. The name, <laughs> the name can come from either it being inclined due to line of sight or the actual orbit. <laughs> yeah, so th I think the name comes from the fact that they are shaped like an ellipse. So in a perfect, you know, ellipse is a circle and then depends on the elongation, then, you know, it goes to sort of more rugby ball shape. So that's where elliptical comes from. It comes from ellipsis. Um, Yes, but very good question. Thank you for asking it. And then if we have a look at these elliptical galaxies, you can see that they're, they're brighter in the centre. So they've got more stars concentrated in the middle and then fewer as we go out to the edges and they kind of sort of slowly fade away. And we believe that like all galaxies, elliptical galaxies have supermassive black holes at their centres and that's around which all of the stars and everything are orbiting. So next up, we have spiral galaxies. So spiral galaxies, you know, uh, they are the pretty boys of the galaxy collection. You know, let's be honest, they're always fantastic to look at. And their name comes from their spiral arms structure that they have. And the spiral arms, you know, they vary greatly. So sometimes they're really well defined, like in the Whirlpool galaxy at the bottom right hand corner, you can see, you know, the spiral arm structure, two beautiful, well defined ones. And then sometimes they're more flocculent as well. And this is NGC 4414 in the top right <coughs> corner. And this is not a grand design spiral like the Whirlpool. You can see that we know it's got spiral arms, but they're kind of fluffy. That's the word that we use to describe them. They're not well defined. You can't kind of pick them out really easily. Sometimes spiral galaxies have a bar structure in the middle. So instead of just having a bright core, you can see here in the top left hand side, they might have an elongated core and exactly how that bar structure forms. We don't know that is an ongoing mystery as to what forms that bar and generates it. But if there's a bar, usually the spiral ends come out of either end of the bar. And then sometimes we see spiral galaxies edge on like the needle galaxy, which is in the bottom left hand corner. And the relative dimensions of spiral galaxies are extraordinary because if you look at the needle galaxy, like Patrick Moore's favourite thing for describing spiral galaxies was two fried eggs slapped back to back. That was his way for describing edge on spiral galaxies. But it doesn't do justice to just how thin spiral galaxies are because their relative dimensions are actually more akin to a CD. So like, that's how thin they are. They are astonishingly fragile. It's absolutely amazing. And again, they have the supermassive black hole at their cores. And if we have a look at spiral galaxies and we think back to that first lecture about the colours of stars, we can see distinctly that the spiral arms of galaxies are particularly blue. And then the cores are kind of looking more yellowy. I think that's, you know, it should be hopefully clear on the screen. And that is because these spiral arms are where the star formation is happening. So that blue colour is coming from these massive, very, very hot stars. Very, very short lived because they have to burn through their fuel so ferociously in order to combat those gravitational forces. And then in the centre, they're dominated by the older, smaller, cooler stars. And that's why their cores are more yellowy. So spiral galaxies are typically what we call gas rich. So about 10% of their mass is just in the form of gas 
ready to form the next generation of stars. And of course, they're full of beautiful dust. You can see all of these dust lanes. And the dust lanes are typically following the spiral arms where you've got this ongoing star formation. And as the stars die, they leave, they put all of that uh, metals and so on back into their spiral arms and goes on to form cosmic dust. So lenticular galaxies are the strange ones because we don't really know how to classify them. When you look at lenticulars, they, they kind of have features of elliptical galaxies because if you look at them, they kind of look like these diffuse spores of light, which is very much like an elliptical. And yet they also have some features of spirals. So quite often they will have a disk feature, which you can particularly see in these two examples. And they've got maybe dust lanes. They're quite prominent, particularly in the one on the left. But like elliptical galaxies, they are very lacking in, in gas. So they're not really going to be going on to form lots of generations of stars. And particularly when they're face on elliptical, uh, when they're face on lenticulars, we can easily mistake them for elliptical galaxies. And we really have no idea where these strange lenticulars come from. We don't know how they form. One thought is that they are sort of fading spirals. So there's, you know, the spiral galaxies which have lost these massive bright blue stars from the spiral arms. But the lenticular galaxies are extraordinarily bright and, you know, even brighter than a lot of spiral galaxies. And so that doesn't really say that they're sort of slowly fading and dying away. Is it something to do, something to strip the gas out of these galaxies? Maybe a close pass by another galaxy has ripped all of the star forming gas out, something like that. Maybe again, it was a merger process that, you know, there was a great big burst of star formation and it used up all of the gas and eventually they'll go on to become ellipticals. But yeah, lenticulars are these kind of strange hybrids that we don't really understand. And of course, that, what, that's what makes them so interesting to study. Then we have irregular galaxies and irregular galaxies are kind of a sort of catch-all for things that don't fit into any of the three previous categories. They are sort of small, medium-sized galaxies. They're typically gas and dust rich. There's often lots of star formation going on. We're getting these bursts of star formation. They're very susceptible to what's going on in their environment. So that is, you know, another galaxy going past or, you know, if they're merging and so on and so on. And there's two broad types of irregular galaxies. So there's type one. So these are, they have some kind of structure, but they don't really fit into spirals or into ellipticals. So there's large and small Magellanic clouds. These would be type one irregular galaxies. And if we have a look at the Magellanic cloud, which I've got in the bottom left hand, uh, the bottom right hand corner, sorry. You can see, if we look at this galaxy, that it's got a core. You can see that there's a definite bright region, but that core is very clearly off center. And also it kind of has what might be a spiral arm that's sort of going around from the core this way, but it's only got one. And spiral galaxies always have an even number of spiral arms. So that's why the Large Magellanic Cloud would fit into the kind of type one category of some features of the previous ones, but not enough to fit into it completely. And then of course, type two are where we have mergers or close interactions. Oh yeah, question. Um, why do have Yeah, that's a really good question. So particularly if they have a bar, they will always have two coming off either end of the bar. And then it just seems to be some kind of symmetry that makes them have an even number. But exactly why there's always an even number, why there isn't five or three is an ongoing debate. Nobody really knows. But we think that there's some kind of symmetry going on, which is forcing it to always have an even number. So yeah, that's a really good question because we don't really know the answer to it. Sorry? Are most orbits at least slightly elliptical? Yes. Yeah, most, most orbits of anything are slightly elliptical, never, you know, absolutely perfect circles. But yeah, exactly why there's always an even number of spiral arms, it's, it's an ongoing debate. Lots of theories, but nothing completely concrete. So yeah, really, really good question. Thank you for asking it. 
So then type twos are these mergers, these close interactions. These are the antenna galaxies. They're always fantastic. And they've got these enormous tidal tails sort of like flowing outwards from those merging galaxies. And this is where gas and dust and stars are being thrown out in the complex interaction of these galaxies. Then the final one to mention really are dwarfs, which are any of the previous category, but really small. So, <laughs> yeah, it That's is. Dwarf. <laughs> yeah, those, those are dwarf galaxies. You can get dwarf ellipticals, you can get dwarf irregulars, you can get dwarf spirals. Those, these are, are much, much rarer. And a new type are ultra compact dwarf galaxies. And they are astonishing. They have a stellar density, which is almost 2,000 that of our local solar neighborhood. So if you imagine, you know, when we were at Cum D with the clear skies, imagine having 2,000 times the amount of stars in the sky. That's what it would look like if you were in one of these ultra compact dwarf galaxies. And this is where the different galaxies sit on what we call the Hubble tuning fork diagram. So Hubble created this, I think it was 1927 when he sort of first published this. And originally it was thought to be an evolutionary track from ellipticals to spirals, but that was never the case. He never said that, people just assumed it. So his original one is on the left and then on the right we've got a modern day version of it. But if anything, the evolution goes the other way, we think, from spirals down to ellipticals. Sorry, is that a common theme then, that it will always evolve? Because I was going to ask, yeah. can they go from one to another other than a coll collision? So we think that spirals will eventually evolve to those elliptical galaxies in one form or another, whether it's because they have a merger, whether you know it's because they, they run out of gas if they are not able to get more gas from the kind of intergalactic environment. And also galaxies, very often they exist in groups and clusters. And it's very rare to sort of find a galaxy on its own in the universe. And then the cluster environment itself is highly dynamic. You know, galaxies are orbiting around each other, you know, so we exist in the local group of galaxies and it's Earth and Andromeda that dominate that. And, you know, eventually the other galaxies are going to get sucked towards us because of our great gravitational influence. And there's also this, this hot gas that exists in the space between galaxies and clusters. And as galaxies fall through that, that hot gas can strip away all of the star forming gas. So we think eventually that galaxies will end up at ellipticals, but the path that they take to get there is highly convoluted and it depends totally on their environment, what part of the universe they exist in. It's, yeah. So when we become the Andromeda way, which is, I think I've heard people yeah, say- the we, Yeah, the Milcomeda, yeah. Next year. No, well, <laughs> tomorrow I heard, when, when yeah. Astro Camp ends. Um, yeah. <laughs> So we would possibly potentially become an elliptical. Yeah, that's what will happen, we think. Yeah, is we'll end up as Milkomeda. That's the, well, is that, the is kind that the of, other yeah. one, Milkomeda? Mil Mil yeah, <laughs> as just this great big ball of chaotically moving stars as all the order is lost, yeah. Well, the, the outer regions are already merging, aren't they? The, um, the gas surrounding the galaxies are starting to merge already. I can, yeah, I can believe that. I, I don't know for sure, but yeah, I can believe that. Yeah, it certainly makes sense. But we don't have to worry about it. We're going to be long gone by the time that happens. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Live forever. <laughs> All right, Elon. <laughs> so, it's... To finish, we'll just uh, talk about our galaxy, the Milky Way. So we live in a spiral galaxy, and our first clue to this is when we look up at the night sky, particularly in the winter here in the autumn. If you come to the September Ash Camp, you'll be able to see the Milky Way across the sky. And we see not, you know, a uniform stars everywhere we look, but we see a concentration of material in a band across the sky. And that kind of gives us our first clue that we live in a sort of flattened, galaxy because we see this concentration of material in a narrow band rather than it being everywhere. And then of course through surveys where we really take the effort to map the positions of stars in our galaxy extremely accurately, measure their motions and such, we can build up a picture like this. So this is a map from Gaia and this is one of the highest re resolution maps of our galaxy. So this is what our galaxy looks like, sort of viewed edge on from our view, because of course we're stuck in the middle of it, so we can't actually see what it looks like from the outside. But this is the picture we build from the middle. 
And then we can also map the gas in the galaxy so we can trace all of this star forming gas, which will be in our spiral arms. And we can do this um, quite easily using hydrogen in uh, radio. And if anyone wants to talk about the details of that later, I'm, I'm happy to do so. And we can map all of this hydrogen gas and then use it to build a picture of what we think our Milky Way galaxy looks like. And this is what we think. We think that we live in a barred spiral galaxy exactly why that bar is there we don't know with two prominent spiral arms and then lots of these what we call minor spurs coming off so maybe we're sitting somewhere between a grand design spiral and a flocculent and there we are just there the sun we just live in a minor part of one of the spurs so one of in the Orion where we spurs. are what are we seeing when we see the Milky Way then so from the northern hemisphere, so where we are, we are looking out this way. Okay. So we, we get a really crappy. So we see that, that bottom bar. Yeah, so we're sort of seeing this part. Okay. And then if you ever go to the southern hemisphere, you're looking towards the galactic center. And so you get to see like all of this material, which is why the Milky Way looks so much better in the southern hemisphere, because you're looking deep sort of into the galaxy. Does that mean to say the southern hemisphere get much more deep sky objects to see than we do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's because they're looking, they've just got so much more material to look at and they're looking towards the core where there's, you know, all sorts of interesting stuff going on. So they just got concentration of material. Yeah, and they, they get to have, and they get the Magellanic Clouds. As if that wasn't enough, they get the satellites of our galaxy to see as well. What was that, sorry? <laughs> yeah, so that is true. Both, the Magellanic Clouds and Globular Clusters. Uh, the Magellanics are obviously outside of our galaxy. Yeah. What about the clusters? Right, so uh, globular clusters tend to exist in the, the halo of our galaxy. So we've got, you know, the, the disc shape of our spiral galaxy. And then it sits in this well of enormous well of dark matter. And then the globular clusters kind of form a spherical sort of case, basically, around our galaxy. They exist, you know, all different levels. Just on the outside. Yeah, so they sort of make a ball shape that our then disk of our spiral galaxy then kind of sits in the middle of that. Yeah, that's where most... And then the open clusters are all in the disk of our galaxy because they're very short-lived. Whereas the globular clusters are really ancient. We don't really know where they come from because they're 11, 12, even 13 billion years old. And so there was some train of thought for a long time that they all sort of formed at the same time with one great big burst of star formation, but recent studies say that actually there's different generations of stars in these balls. So we don't know, maybe they're the remnant cores of galaxies which have been absorbed by the Milky Way. Are they the remnants from the very early galaxies? And that's how galaxies began, was as these little balls of stars. Yeah, they, they are an ongoing mystery as well. There's, there's so much we don't know. We know a lot, but then there's also so much more that we don't know. And then our nearest galaxy, uh, is the Andromeda and it is also a, a spiral. We see it half inclined, yeah. Um, so back, think about your previous slide, are there any stars that aren't in galaxies or are there any that are just by themselves? Oh yeah. Yes, there are stars which are not in galaxies, but detecting those sort of on their own is, is very, very difficult. It's, they can be flung out. So when we have the mergers, for example, you can get stars flung out just in space and then they just exist on their own wandering through the space between galaxies, feeling very sorry for themselves. <laughs> so then our nearest uh, galaxy is also a spiral galaxy. This is Andromeda. We see it sort of half inclined from edge on to face on. And you can see it's got a couple of very prominent satellite galaxies. We've got M110 and, uh, and M32 as well. And I was, I kind of put this up because I thought, oh, it's forecast to be clear tonight, so you can try and find Andromeda, but I don't think it is, so. But if you ever were interested in trying to find Andromeda because you can't see it with the naked eye, that is where you would find it. And that's the end for that. That's the, the different types of galaxies.